and thank you so much for checking out this episode of Promote the Hell Out of It. I have been really excited to share it with everyone and I've been excited to chat to my guest who is Jack from, you might know him from the band Waco and he also writes some incredible articles for Vice magazine, he's written for Sidewalk, for Kerrang! Uh, and we chat about all that stuff but I've been excited to chat to Jack since last time we had a conversation in Barcelona on the beach. He's one of these people that as soon as you chat to him the conversations get real deep and it's conversations that uh, that you'll remember for a long time. And I hope that this podcast is a representation of that because we cover a lot of topics, not only the obvious ones that you would expect us to talk about, like his articles. And, and with his articles, we really go all over the world. We talk about the, the skate scene in, in Africa. We talk about the music scene in Southeast Asia. Uh, and we talk about a load of other really interesting topics surrounding those um, but we also go really deep into spirituality, religion, conspiracy theories, multiverses, the idea of intelligent design but not for a god. Um, so yeah, we get real deep and if you enjoy this conversation, then hopefully you will enjoy a lot of the other conversations that are coming up on the podcast too. But I would also recommend going back and listening to last week's podcast, which was with Kelly Kemp. And again, we cover a lot of interesting subjects. Uh, including Curtis and Solidarity, Cooperatives, Intermittent Fasting, and lots more. So yeah, I am going to play you uh, a teaser from the band Waco so that you can get a vibe for them. Please go check them out afterwards because they are absolutely one of my favourite bands with very cool vibes. Um, and after that, I will jump right into the conversation with Jack. Enjoy. <laughs> So, dude, how have you been? I've been looking forward to chatting to you. Yes, mate, I've been good, man. I feel spiritually strong and robust. I feel optimistic about the future of not only my me and my friends and family, but for the whole human race. Ah, oh, that's great. Yeah, man, that's enough about me. How are you doing? No, dude, not enough about you. This is that's what it's all about. It's all about you. This podcast is about you today. Woo! Let's yeah. go, let's get it. Right. My ego it's, it's is the gonna Jack get... show. <laughs> right, my ego is gonna go like a freight train, a runaway train. Let's talk about me. I um, hope so, I hope so. So uh yeah, last time I saw you, we were in Barcelona. And sunny, sunny Barcelona. And now you're in where are you now? Leeds, rainy, rainy Leeds. It's freezing up here and it's a bit of a culture shock, to be honest. Do you know what, though? That's Leeds' character, man. You can still have a good time in the rain in Leeds, I reckon. Oh, absolutely, yeah. We, we actually we got back because obviously we'd been in Southeast Asia and we landed in the UK in Manchester. So uh, both Manchester, we've done Manchester, Liverpool and now Leeds and they're all rainy, but great fun. They're like really cool cities. Nice, nice. I, I wanted to ask you something about your travels, um, and it's a two-part question, and it perhaps it's a little bit probing, but um, one, why did you go travelling, and two, no, that's the first question, actually, why did you go travelling? To, to do those places in, in general, you know, because some people never do in their whole lifetime. Well, I mean, there's there's a lot of of parts to that question. I went traveling because it's something that I've always wanted to do. Uh, and I want to travel as much of the world as possible. I am obsessed by the culture, the food, the people. Um, so that's the reason for going. But the reason for going when we did was because we felt like if we waited for the perfect circumstances, we were never going to actually do it. It was never going to be the right time to actually take that leap and do something that that generally you think you've got to save a shit ton of money for, if that makes yeah, sense. Yeah, I, I know what you mean. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, you can wait and wait and wait forever. And, okay, so you wanted to go. Why did you want to go from when you were a kid? Because you, oh, you said because you, you like different cultures and different foods and different uh, peoples. Um, did, yeah. Was it what you thought it was it was more like trip. more than i thought it was absolutely every like 
there was countries that we went to that we didn't know anything about like malaysia was a country that we we ended up spending almost two months there instead of the the two weeks we had planned uh because we just fell in love with the country and uh but it's not always the the places you expect to like that are the ones you're impressed by if that makes any sense yes absolutely that does make a lot of sense um, so you're, well, then again, traveling, I would say, is in your blood a little more than other people, or like, <laughs> in your habits, because you're from Tenerife, is that right? Yeah, yeah, like traveling is definitely something that, like, my, my dad and my mum traveled with me through Europe in a van when I was, what, two or three, uh, yeah. and my dad loved traveling until his slip disc kind of made camping and stuff very, very difficult for him. Yeah. Um, but obviously, yeah, I moved from, from Tenerife to England, back to Tenerife, back to England. Um, and then I started touring and I was homeless from pretty young as well, moved around the UK a lot. So the idea of moving somewhere new isn't really yeah. a big deal to me. Like, yeah, I yeah. think it's, I, oh, I look forward to, to that new place. Yeah, absolutely. It, it's interesting because although there, it's, you just mentioned some uh, difficult circumstances in which you have that you were traveling around, I think that um, something that gets overlooked, perhaps, maybe not, but I've realized something that kind of gets overlooked is just uh, people people seeing themselves doing that. I, 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 I mean, I'll, I'll uh, illustrate what I'm trying to say with, with an anecdote. I, um, I work with young people a lot uh, as a youth worker. And a youth worker told me years and years ago, he was a great guy from uh, Birmingham, he grew up, he was in his 40s, he grew up in um, Handsworth in Birmingham, a pretty rough area, and he's black. And he said that when he was growing up, when he was a teenager, and even right through his 20s, he said, I didn't know anybody who had gone traveling. I didn't know anyone who'd left the country. Sure. And all, his whole life was the estates around Birmingham where he lived. His whole life was that. And people didn't go, oh, I might yeah. take a gap year and go, you know, and find myself. He said it wasn't even in their, in their lexicon. It wasn't even the thing people would say to each other. And so he said he was focused on making money and cracking on and trying to, you know, keep his head above water. And he said he um, got a passport when he was in his 40s and he went to university when he was in his 40s, all because of his socioeconomic uh, situation didn't really permit, like, Let's go traveling. Let's go abroad. Yeah, yeah, of course. It's in, it's interesting that for me, because it has crossed my mind a lot, um, that I've got the privilege or at least the comfort to think, oh, you know what? Fuck it. I might just go away for a bit. Or I might go away and try some new things. And you think, man, it's not just a socioeconomic barrier, but for some people, it's a it's a mental blockade. Like if you can't imagine yourself doing something, or if you can't imagine if you don't know anyone who's done something, then you can't, you know, there's a lot of pressure to go, oh, I know what I'll do. I'll just try something that, magic it out of thin air and, and do something. Absolutely, so, yeah. So although you've traveled in, in um, under quite difficult circumstances in the past, I just think it's quite nice to be thankful and grateful that it's even in our in our world, the idea of traveling, to go other places, to Definitely. leave our estates. A lot of the kids I work with in Tottenham and uh, in Harringay and in Hackney and all that, they their whole life is their estate. Their whole life is that part, that postcode. They did not even been to central London before, let alone fucking Barbados. For no, reason. yeah. But no one does that. I grew up with a lot of people in Bournemouth who were the same. You talk to them from the age of 15. They knew they didn't want to travel anywhere. They wanted to get married. They wanted to buy a house in Bournemouth. And the idea, like a holiday for them was going maybe to Southampton. That's yeah. that's as far as they'd go. Uh, and the idea of that is is pretty odd. But yeah. I think it, it's funny you mentioned the socioeconomic situation. And obviously we're, we're very lucky in the part of the world we're in. And that in the last 15 years, uh, plane ticket prices have obviously got a hell of a lot cheaper. Yeah. Um, but you still find a lot of people think the idea of going somewhere else is is out of their socioeconomic situation. Oh, definitely. It's, sad. It's, it's sad because it, it's, um, yeah, I, I agree. They think it is. I mean, everyone can, but I mean, it's a strange thing. I've gone back and forward with it because I think like 
plane travel is kind of fucking demonic, really. It's really bad for them. But it's yeah, it is, world. yeah. I can fly to Russia for cheaper than I can to get a train back up north where I'm from. And you think, it's like it's like the bitter end of capitalism when you can fly somewhere. It's ridiculous, yeah. Bonkers. But, um, but, I mean, I guess it's very enriching, personally, and if you can help yeah. with it, and if you can help people along the way, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll bring your bring how it's enriched you back to your your everyday life and help other people then it's a positive thing yeah it's it's all tied in because i think part of the reason people can't afford to go to places is because they've got this idea of what a holiday should be and it's a week doing everything you want to do eating wherever you want fancy restaurants staying at a nice hotel and if you do it that way not only can you not afford it but rarely are you actually giving back to the community that that you're going to visit whilst you can do it a lot cheaper by staying in local accommodation by going to eat at local places and then you're giving a lot back to the community as well but surely giving money through tourism or eating at fancy restaurants that is helping in some way maybe well absolutely it depends really because obviously if you've got a chain like mcdonald's Regardless of where it is, they're paying their staff very poor wages. The, the staff are taking back a fraction of they would be if you're if you're putting that money into an independent business. The money stays in the economy, in their economy longer if you're not giving it to McDonald's, for example. That's true. That's true. Um, so I want to talk about things like uh, community and spirituality and religion in our, in our talk today, because these are things that I've got quite a of course um if you don't mind me uh again probing a little bit um, probe away probe I've been, away I've, I've been spending some time well i have done for years with different religious groups or religious orders um but you yourself are part of a religious order is that right in tenerife and i'd like to because last time we were quite drunk when we were talking about this and it was <laughs> enlightening then but i'd like to ask you to elaborate on what I'm, what I'm getting at. Okay, so uh, I was brought up a Jehovah's Witness, not just in Tenerife when my parents came over to the UK as well. Uh, I was a Jehovah's Witness through to the age of 21, officially. Uh, in my head, probably only to the age of 17, where I started doing what I wanted, but hiding it from everyone else. Um, so yeah, Jehovah's Witnesses, it's, it's a Christian organization, but they don't attach themselves and they're very different to every other Christian organization, yeah, and, really. Um, I think something's quite personal, but I mean, there's a reason why you, why you left or why you, why you no longer believed or was there a eureka moment where you're like, hold on, this isn't what I thought it was or this isn't... Um, you know, this isn't real, or this isn't true, or this isn't helping me. Was there a moment, or did you just slowly grow up? Uh, in all honesty, no, there wasn't. I think it it started off being more of an internal battle, uh, an internal battle of knowing that what I liked doing and what I was doing and the friends I liked were in complete contradiction to what I was being told I was supposed to be doing. That's how it, it really started off. But then obviously the conversations you have with those friends and I started playing in bands with people from work and things like that start to make you question more and more things. So I think that I, with me, I more slowly drifted away from, from that line of thinking and got to the point where my life was in complete sort of contradiction to what, what I was expected to be doing. And that became a burden because I was, I was literally having to hide all the time. I, I'd be out in London playing gigs and trying to smoke a cigarette outside the venue and trying to hide at the same time in case Jehovah's Witness walked past and anyone found out kind of thing. And that became a uh, knackery. <clears throat> that sounds heavy, man. Uh, and what could you summarise, pretty, pretty big task, could you summarise what the Jehovah's Witness beliefs are? Um, obviously, it's Christian, but, I mean, people only really know, people know maybe the surface of what Jehovah's Witnesses believe. What's, what's the driving force of, of the organisation? So the driving force, and they do try and do this to their best of their ability, questionably with, with questionable results, but they do try, is to, to be unhypocritical towards what the Bible says. So, for example, 
as opposed to writing their own translation of the Bible, they compared every translation of the Bible and used what was the what was the common translations, as opposed to trying to edit it to to fit what they want to get out of it, if that makes any sense. Um, okay. But that also means they're extremely strict with things like they don't celebrate birthdays, they don't celebrate Christmas, uh, they don't celebrate Easter, um, all based on on that study of what the Bible says happened and and should be done. Okay. Okay. Interesting. So. People say the King James version of the Bible is the truest translation of of the Hebrew texts. Is that what they follow, or or they have their own? They have their own version. When I was growing up, we used the New World Translation of the Bible, which, as I say, is taken from the majority. So, like taking all the the recognised translations of the Bible, and and used to create. Uh, one that is is common because for example the the saint james uh, is it the king james version of the bible is missing the name of god in the bible yeah, for yeah. example so that in itself was done as part of of a way of gaining control over people and taking an identity away from god so the church would have more power which is exactly what jehovah's, jehovah's witnesses were trying to sort of to combat ah. and what and what compels them to recruit or, or to spread the message, is it just because they, I mean, if you think about it, hey, I, I don't really have a problem with people knocking on my door and trying to tell me the truth, because if you think about it, if you discovered, if I discovered what I thought was the true meaning of, of why we're here, and it really brought me happiness and contentment, of course I'd want to sing it from the roof, rooftops. But I talk about things that I love all the time to people, like all the time, and they probably get yeah. bored of it. But, um, so, you've you've kind of answered you've answered your own question really yeah is that is that what it is is it's, that the, is that the that's, that's that's half of it absolutely um but I I'd throw the question back at you and say why is any other Catholic or Christian organization not going from door to door when Jesus literally told his his followers to go from door to door teaching his his word oh yes yeah, so they're going off they people need to book up ideas <laughs> but, but, yeah, I know, I know what you mean. Um, it's interesting. It's interesting because I think people have got his egos on. Why are these Jehovah's Witnesses knocking on my door, disturbing me? It's like, fucking hell, man. Get off the couch, answer the door. <laughs> but But um, that's interesting. What about... So it's very true to the Bible. It's very, that's, that, that's what it is. It's, a very, it's trying to say true, yeah. the true meaning of the Bible. That's what, it, that's what it's about. Yeah. But then obviously it comes down to, so for me, it, it came down to, is it good to stick so much to the true meaning of the Bible in a, a day and age when things have, have moved forward from when Jesus said those words? You're trying to stick to things that uh, in a lot of ways are extremely outdated and to advice that wasn't taken into account things like social media, the internet, uh, TV, books, all those things that, that are so easily consumed nowadays. And, and it's quite, yeah, you, you're right, I think things have to be looked at in, in a certain context and uh, a historical understanding because uh, the more I've looked into the Bible, studied it with certain uh, groups of people, um, it's almost a history lesson at the same time as a spiritual journey because it's like trying to work out what they're referring to, what kind of political situation was happening at the time, and there's so many things to take into account. So I'd argue the advice is is largely still sound, however, not word for word, because things change. Absolutely. Always. And what, what about, are they quite, are they quite, are some, um, some denominations are quite, quite damning to non-believers or to uh, Stephen's or people who've left, left the church? Is that, is that their vibe as well? So, this is where it gets, this is where it gets difficult in terms of they are not damning of people who aren't Jehovah's Witnesses at all. They uh, they can have very good relationships with people that, that aren't Jehovah's Witnesses. Um, although they're not supposed to to spend too much time with them in social kind of situations. Um, but that rule is quite lax. However, if you are disfellowshipped, which is my, my situation where I was baptised as a Jehovah's Witness and then... Uh, I left the religion, or and was excommunicated. It's, it's fellowship. Yeah, then the relationship is cut. So, for example, my parents 
have a great relationship with Jane, my girlfriend, but with me, the communication is, is very sort of little and is hardly there. So they, they kind of talk to me through my girlfriend, Jane. So in, in their eyes, and in, in their eyes are representative of, of, of the faith in general, it, your um, communication with you is is worse, is, is less godly than communication with someone who's never been never been no no that's no that's not the vibe that they that they take from it the vibe they take from it is that they love me so much that uh by by taking away their blessing almost they are encouraging me to ah, think about my actions so and got... come back to them if that makes any sense so it's the whole bible account of the prodigal son so the prodigal son goes away does whatever he wants the dad doesn't approve but when he comes back, he he takes him in with open arms. That kind of situation. Oh, so it's so it's it's pretty heavy technique, pretty heavy tactics. But it's trying to hopefully make you see, re, uh, yeah, reaffirm, eventually come back to the light. I guess to to the. the that's faith. yeah. That's the idea. Unfortunately, it doesn't always work in their favour, because humans are humans, and sometimes the way that people are our disfellowship for example isn't done the best way possible or sometimes the people who's disfellowshipped needed some help in other situations that would have helped them in other ways or sometimes it just doesn't come across as the most loving and caring thing to do for an organization that should be doing that if that makes any sense um but yeah it's it's an odd one it's a very uh weird situation so what, um, yeah, yeah it's interesting certainly um so what I've ever since learned, um, or any really big takeaways being part of such a such a tight community and such a, a big support. Because obviously, it, it's it's very easy to look at it negatively now that you've you're deep in despair. But for a long time, it was life. So, what what do you think you could look, you could learn from it? I don't I don't I don't view it in a negative. I did view it in a negative light. Like when I started, I think when I first met you and I was playing in grayscale. Uh, yeah it was very much talking about it in a in a negative light and the the negative effect religion had had upon me um and i think that it was normal like for the first 3 years of of being disfellowshipped and that's when i was homeless and i was in a very bad situation it was very easy to blame that on on that situation that had happened when in actual fact that's that's not true i needed to i needed to make my own choices and part of those choices involved the the things that happened happening so that I could come out stronger from it. Um, and what I quickly realized is that the morals that I'd picked up from the religion, those were the things that had helped me actually succeed and get over the, the tough situations I'd been in. Ah, interesting. So it empowered you. It empowered well, the lessons you that had empowered you to go your own way, so to speak, or to survive. I'd go as... I'd go I'd I'd go as far as saying that the times I was in in the worst situations were almost a direct result of trying to trying to go against the things I'd been brought up believing trying to be sort of a person that I wasn't trying to rebel completely against those things as opposed to to trying to find myself as who I really was which which incorporates yeah, those absolutely. morals and those things um, I've been brought up with there's some famous Jehovah's witnesses prince is the most famous uh Jehovah's witness yeah. Wonderful singer, Prince. I love Prince. Um, and uh, yeah, and um, Prince is great. I understand that Jones Witness. Sorry, to just go on about this. I think this is so interesting because a lot of people don't know this. So hopefully, through me learning about it, they, the listeners can too. Um, Jones Witnesses. They have a big meet up. Is that right in uh, in <laughs> Twickenham Stadium in London? The British Stadium. There is one in Twickenham Stadium. Yeah, there's there's quite a few around the UK and. Twickenham Stadium, so there's one a year that's a big one, and there's a few around the UK. Um, and, well, they're all, ar all around the world, really, and they're absolutely massive three-day events where there's talks given, and, and wow. it's not just Jehovah's Witnesses. They invite, like, the general public as well. Uh, yeah, it's it's regardless of of faith and belief and anything like that, it's pretty astounding to see because it's it's the only time a sports stadium will be that full and will be left that clean and the police won't have to deal with any trouble <laughs> yeah yeah wow and what, what happens so there's different seminars and um 
you you were quite happy in the church, were you, for, for that for that for the time you were in them for your age? I I I I was at a time. Uh, I shouldn't have been. If but it it was a it was a strange situation, and and this is all on me as opposed to on the religion. But I found it very difficult when I was younger to compartmentalize what I wanted to do versus yeah. not letting my parents down. I was I was I found it very tough to 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 make decisions I knew would hurt my parents because I know how how much they've suffered throughout their lives and how much they've done and and what the religion means to them. Um, so yeah, I found it quite tough to sort of put like separate those two things. Must be something you still still struggle with, right? I, I mean, everyone not not to um, you know not to just brush over it, but a lot of people do struggle with that with religious parents or not religious parents that. You know, following a life that you lead or I've led, you know, in bands or living alternatively, doesn't always wash out with parents or with any, yeah. with any family or elders. But that must be something you still deal with. I mean, yeah, and it's, <coughs> and it wasn't just the the religion that had an impact on that. You know, like for example, the fact that at the age of four I'd come over to the UK with my parents. My parents struggled with the language for a long time. So at the age of eight, maybe, I was helping them with with their taxes. I was translating like doctor's appointments that were like pretty like yeah. epic big deals to my parents. And I was getting involved in all this stuff. Um, so I, it, we, were, we had quite a, a strong, close knit relationship that made it quite difficult to let them down, but also meant that I was very aware of of the pain they were in like physically of the of the shit they'd gone through in their past like my dad grew up like in the dictatorship yeah. has the time ago had to be in the war in the army for for franco all this shit that that goes on um so yeah it the everything kind of adds up to to making it very difficult to to sometimes be honest to your parents about things you know they won't yeah, like absolutely so so you were hosting were you, were you holding seminars were you doing talks Is that you i was doing yeah i've done i've read the bible in front of like i've been up on on the stage at twickenham for example being interviewed not giving a seminar or, or a talk but i have given public talks in front of like kingdom halls full of people, sort of seventy to a hundred plus people. The rock star, um, mate, that's the birth of the rock star. That's I, it, I did, <laughs> um, and it did help me a lot become quite a good public speaker. Well, skills that I lost a lot through uh, partying too much and taking too many drugs, and will hopefully gather back through yeah. the help of this podcast. Um, but yeah, it's uh, it's it's strange thinking back about all that all that part of my life, and I tried to kind of. It's very different going from doing a public talk to a hundred people who are listening to every word you say, to to playing a punk show and going on tour and doing like a show to like ten people sometimes. You know what I mean? Yeah, ten people who are not listening to what you say or what you play. Yeah. Okay, man. It's um, <laughs> it's uh, it's fun, man. Like we were talking about this before. Like the stuff you go through in a band of our of our uh, level of our experience. Like if you looked at it. In the abstract, if you weren't in this world and you looked at it from afar, it seemed totally crackers. Like you drive fucking six hours to a gig, and there's no one there. You get paid nothing, and you come back freezing cold, and you wake up and go to work the next day. And there's, there's <laughs> some things where you think, what is, what is, you know, what's making me keep doing it? But it must be music. It must be. It must be something in it that makes you, you know, drive to the old turn up. There's no one there. Promote is not there, and then and then you still leave it in high spirits. You know, next day you're like, let's do it all over again. <laughs> Yeah, you have to work hard. At it, man. Like it's, good things in life don't come if you don't work hard for them. I think, or at least you don't. At least you don't appreciate it as much if it just falls into your lap. Um, I was I was trying to explain to Jane's dad, my girlfriend's dad. Uh, he, he he was like, so why why do you go on tour? <laughs> and uh, and what do you do? <laughs> I, I asked myself. So I. I <laughs> <laughs> and I was trying to explain to him, so, so what does your day consist of when you're on tour? Okay, so you drive, and then you load out all this heavy equipment, you put it on the stage, you wait around for the sound engineer to turn up, then you watch some bands, then yeah. you're pretty shattered, but you get up on stage and you play, and then you sleep on someone's floor, and you do yeah, that yeah. for five to ten nights. <laughs> and they're just <laughs> like, so how much do you get paid? Well... 
not much by the like it goes back into petrol yeah. really and then maybe you sell <laughs> and it's like so why do you do yeah, it well, I think because it, I enjoy funny. it you just watch yeah but but why <laughs> yeah man I want to be like Metallica I want to be like you know not be like yeah the tour life the tour life's glamorous and then you actually do it and it's a little bit less than glamorous sometimes and then you think Ah, well, I had a great time. And usually it is great fun, even if you are sleeping on floors, if you're eating vegetable samosas five times a day. It's, uh, I know, it's, it's an alternative way. Of, That's the thing, you get yeah, something exactly, out of it. Man, like, it. Exactly. That's what keeps us going back. And I, it's very hard to break our spirits. You know, we've broken down in the middle of nowhere. We've been for 12 hours before for gigs and even more and got pulled over by the police in Germany at gunpoint. All that stuff, and you think, and you, think you know what? So what? If we made someone smile on stage, while we're on stage, if we made someone smile, or we made someone have a good night, or we changed someone's perspective, or yeah. whatever it is, I mean, my job's done. You know, I put my comfort, I put my comfort on the shelf for this one, and and sleep, when I get, sleep when I get home. <laughs> it's so true. It's so true. And when I was uh, touring Europe, I was the only driver, and wow. uh, I slept maybe like four or five hours in five days to the point where it, it became dangerous and I had to have a real think when I got back about uh, how much I needed to sleep when I was driving on tour or get a driver. Um, but I, I can remember getting back and Jane just being like, oh man, you're not going to want to like tour for so long. And <laughs> the next morning, the first thing I started doing was booking yeah, the next tour. It's like, there's no way that you want to stop doing yeah, that regardless no, of how much exactly. it hurts. It's, uh... I don't know, yeah, it, it, it's a working project and that's what makes it so good. If it was easy, it wouldn't be as fun. Come on, no way. Without, without all the hiccups and without all the shit gigs and absolutely, without all the, um, absolutely. you know, the gigs with no sound check, nowhere to stay, all the stuff you think, it, it, it'd just be boring. It'd be mundane. What everything's done for you, we have a wonderful hotel. <laughs> no way. Not for me, man. Oh, man, it's true. Whilst we're on the subject of music, I want to chat to you about the article you wrote for Kerrang! about... Uh, the punk uprising in Cambodia. Oh yeah. Because uh, park, yeah. I find it fucking fascinating. And I was in Malaysia, and they've got some really cool stuff going on there with with the punk scene as well in Penang. So I kind of wanted to to chat a bit. Do you want to maybe explain a bit to yeah. anyone who listens what the article's about? And I'll obviously link yeah, to it so people can read it. But uh, it would be good to get your your thoughts Did on you it. Go to Cambodia when you were, when you were traveling. Dude, no, I, I was reading your article when I was in, in Vietnam um, and it just got to the point towards the end where we run out of time. Like we uh, we had to come back. We were there for almost yeah. nine months and we didn't get half as much as we wanted done no, because we were working enough. at the same time. Uh, never mind. Um, so I, uh, I went to a poetry night and there was this guy there, a lovely guy called Miles. He just stopped me. And, no, sorry, he didn't stop me. He was running the night and I just... I got invited and I'd never done it before, uh, spoken word night. So I went up there on stage and I did my thing and it was well scary. I didn't tell any of my friends about it. I didn't tell anyone I knew about it. I just wanted to give myself a creative challenge, which <laughs> was, and I felt better for it. Um, but anyway, this guy, Miles, who was running it, we were just chatting and chatting and chatting. And he said, he said that he'd, he just mentioned like flippantly that he started a record label or he helped start a record label in Cambodia for punk and metal and hardcore music. I was like, no way. That, yeah, I was like, that sounds so cool. And he said, yeah, it's the only like alternative record label in Cambodia. And no way. A few, we've got a few bands on it. And eventually he kind of helped build it with a few of the uh, Khmer people uh, in bands. And then he just left because his time in Cambodia came to an end. He, he wanted to move on. And I thought, this is so interesting. So anyway, so I started doing a bit of research and there's like four bands, pretty much four or five bands in Cambodia that are uh, making metal and hardcore music. And it's interesting about Cambodia, it's got a very tragic and bloody past um, with Khmer Rouge, dictatorship, civil wars, like for hundreds of years. But yeah. in the past, you know, 60 years, particularly bloody. Um, so no, no real music, alternative music scenes have been able to blossom really because there was a surf rock scene in the 70s ah, I think so in cool. the 60s, early 70s, late 60s surf rock the music's amazing it's all psychedelic and surfy but then because of the conflicts in Vietnam and Cambodia were kind of occupied um they the scene kind of died really quickly and the reason they started yeah. making surf music was because they got a lot of American radio because of all the American army bases that were set up in Cambodia 
That's quite ah, interesting. So, cool. so they were like listening to the American surf sound and they were mimicking it and just making it their own. But it didn't last very long because there was such a genocide that followed and all yeah. this kind of stuff that nothing could really blossom in the same way that it has done elsewhere. But anyway, now, so there's never been a rock scene or punk scene really. Like there actually just hasn't been one. So these young lads in Cambodia now, they've started making rock and really like heavy metal and uh, hardcore music. Um, but they're pretty much, they haven't got any direct influences in their country. There's no like, oh, let's make music like Led Zeppelin, like we have here. Like, oh, let's, you know, even like, let's look back at Electric Wizard or like, all these English bands that are in our recent past making rock music or influential music. Or peers, there's no peers there. There's no like, oh, let's make music like, you know, um, Don Rocco or whatever people are listening to. So they have to, they have to pretty much form it from nothing out of the ashes of, of, of the conflicts of their country. They've, they've risen out of the ashes and they've made their own scene by watching YouTube videos and watching like sleep videos on YouTube and like Megadeth and Metallica and going, that's fucking cool, I want to do that. Oh, not going, but, uh, imagine looking around at your country and going, hold on, I can't find one Cambodian metal band, but maybe we could be the first Cambodian metal band. So over the past like five to 10 years, a few bands have emerged um, and they, they're they fucking great. They're really good and they're really young, mostly. Um, some, some, one of the lads, uh, some of the lads spoke to used to be orphans uh, and then they made this band through some uh, NGO program and some, some of the other lads are kind of, like listening to hardcore music and doing the hardcore thing and it's really really fascinating um like i think 75 percent of the country are uh, 30 and under that's the population because because of all the war uh, because because of all the war in the recent past and it's, it's got a very good population in Cambodia. yeah and uh so the bands the bands are really but anyway the was fast lads and some of them spoke english pretty well some of them we kind of use it with translation and they wanted me to email them the question so they could translate it and you get, Cambodia's even got a quite um, a tainted, uh, quite a tainted reputation now for things like child child sex trafficking and awful, awful things. Um, but obviously that's not the reality for everyone in the country. And uh, and I just think it's so fascinating to see, yeah. to see such a, such an exciting scene just emerging out of nowhere. So I, I just eat these guys and they put on gigs now and again and uh, yeah, it's just an amazing journey of, of them just chipping away at it and having literally nothing. Like these lads who are orphans, um, their 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 band name is oh, Dog in in Cambodian, um, because they lived like dogs. Yeah. That's their story. We lived like dogs. We were like scavenging for food. We had nowhere to live. We were sleeping with the dogs in the street. Fucking t- like t- um, awful stories. But they've channeled all their rage into this music, and they think, man, that's so pure. I so so pure, especially when it comes to angry, aggressive music. It's got a message that you're trying to say something. It's it's, it's fast. It, you cannot get more. It, it distilled down to such a perfect, a perfect storm, so to speak. But when it comes to politics, they can't really speak openly against uh, the government. Uh, the government they have. So they kind of have semi-political songs and kind of skirt around it, like a lot of Chinese punk yeah. fans do. I read an article about Chinese punk and hardcore. They they kind of sometimes sing in English or they. Or they sing meth- in metaphor. Yeah, you've got to skirt it's around. Kind of, it's kind of, yeah, you've got yeah, to skirt kind of, around it's the so subject. Interesting. We take it. We take it. I mean, again, I don't want to generalise, but it, it, it's very easy to take for granted our the fact that we can be like, "Fuck it, now we'll protest the government." Now, I'll write a song saying, you know, "Fuck Theresa May" or whatever you want to write about it in the UK. You can pretty much write about it. Like you can write about it. You can sing about it. But it's become so much that way that people don't. That's the yeah. thing that people got so used to the fact. That I know, yeah, I know exactly what you mean. It's kind of become saturated, or satirized, but it's 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 mad that we've got this power that, that a lot a lot of other countries can't really have. Like one of the lads was um, someone told me off the record, but uh, I'm not going to name any names. But someone was like put in jail for um, someone was put in jail for having their Facebook photo as the, as the anonymous mask. You know, the anonymous. Wow. Yeah, 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 yeah. Someone in, within one of the circles of the Facebook circles of friends. That's what I do. One of them, that, that that was that was seen as way too anti-government, and they was put in jail for it. And his Facebook post just so, "Hey man, you, you got to be wow. thankful. You got to be grateful where we live." About uh... yeah, that's a thing. That's a thing. I I met some um I met some friends in in Malaysia. We met 
we made really good friends with these people. Uh, this guy that runs a, a hidden cocktail bar, speakeasy cocktail bar. Uh, he owns, he owns like a skate shop in the front, and then in the back he's got like the most amazing cocktail bar. Um, but instead of buying a cocktail, you you buy a, an enamel pin off him, and you get given a cocktail, which is really oh, cool. That's good. Um, that's clever, yeah, clever it's really funny. Yeah. Yeah, and and the first thing I asked him was like, "Oh, do you know any recording studios here?" And he was like, "Yeah, yeah, you need to you need to meet my mate who runs Soundmaker Studios, because uh, he's into the same kind of music as you." And I was like, "Cool." So I get home and I start researching Soundmaker Studios, and it turns out that um, the Malaysian government uh, banned death metal and metal music for for a long time because they were so anti it. And and also would regularly just turn up. The police would turn up uh, to punk gigs, just break in and basically search everyone for drugs, put a load of people in prison. Uh, yeah, it was pretty nasty. And this this studio was the only studio that uh, kept making punk records, kept working with punk bands, kept putting on shows. And he's been doing it so for the past like ten years. It's like ridiculously cool story. Wow of someone who's been a real pioneer of sort of the punk scene oh, that out there. Um, it. Yeah, it, you need to look into it, dude. And then there's Mayamar as well. There's a, a really cool, tiny little punk scene going on in Mayamar. Um, I didn't get to to go out, unfortunately, but my friend who actually played in the punk band with me when I was a Jehovah's Witness, he was also a Jehovah's Witness and isn't anymore either. He lives out in Mayamar now. Um, and he puts on punk gigs there, and there's one of the bands actually managed to get over to tour the UK. Wow. Um, I believe it was Rebel Riot, I think they're right, called, right. Um, from Yangon. Yeah, it's like ridiculously cool stories of countries that have suffered a hell of a lot and are making really intense yeah, punk yeah. music that is is really close to, yeah, yeah. to its roots Absolutely. kind of thing. Um, yeah, it's awesome. Mate, so I'm going to have to go to the bathroom. Dude, that's absolutely fine, man. No worries whatsoever. <laughs> Hello? Hey, hey, how's it going? I'm not back, I'm back. Sorry, uh, I'd muted my mic and forgot it was on mute and was talking to oh. you as if you were still there. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to keep you too much longer anyway because I try and keep the episode sort of to the hour, the hour length. Um, but there are a few more things... I think we should uh, we should touch on at least. Um, uh, me too. Me too. I think I've, I've come in here, you know, empty handed. I've got to all of Excellent. So one of the things I wanted to touch on was your article for Sidewalk because simply the fact that you've got an article for Sidewalk is pretty fucking awesome. Um, yeah. Man. But also, again, it's it's another one of these topics that's similar to what we were just chatting about. Like skateboarding in Uganda isn't the first thing that that jumps to your mind. No. So what brought that article on? Um, so, yes, yeah, it's, it's a small article to interview with someone who runs the Ugandan Skateboarding Federation. I love that. I love that name <laughs> for so Federation. Cool. Yeah. And uh, it's a pretty new – over there he calls it – he called it a game. It's called Jose. He calls it a game. Just <laughs> like, you know, playing football or whatever. Um, he, call it a, he called it a game anyway. So it's a new game over there. And – it's so like DIY, you wouldn't believe it. These DIY skaters <laughs> uh, and like skateboarding communities, even the DIY punk communities have got nothing on these guys. They're literally building ramps out of like leftover bricks that they found and concrete in little half pipes. And it's fucking cool, man. And they, I found them just on Instagram. Uh, they're on Instagram. It's well cool to watch because they can be all skating barefooted. They look about seven or eight years old and they're, they're little rippers they're really i'm cool. looking at the photos right um, now they're so ridiculous man it's so cool great man yeah yeah it's so cool and i think it's a new game over there and they i know that in, in other parts of uh in other parts of africa there are more established on the scenes but uganda it's pretty much only in the past uh less than 10 years so yeah i loved it because a lot, a lot oh, of wow. a lot of skateboards donate skateboards are donated they don't get skate, skateboards from skate shops in Uganda. Uh, I think maybe people don't, sell, don't buy and sell them in that way. They just kind of get them pe- traveling or people send the donations. Um, but they, uh, but yeah, I just found it so fascinating because again, like we talked about skateboarding as a community 
tool. It was like to keep. I mean, some of these, some of these cities, they've, they've been ravaged by AIDS. It's it's really sad. Like the whole everything's been, everything's yeah, been yeah. flipped upside down for them. The whole life is 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 really ravaged from AIDS from the nineties and that. But they um, but it's a community tool. It's kids like off the street uh, into a skate park uh, doing something productive, and kids and adults alike, you know. And just the the whole approach to skating is refreshing, but both both philosophically and and actually skating the way they skate. I just thought it was so cool. And um, again, like imagine literally just carving it out of nothing. Imagine just literally just carving a scene from nothing, like going like there there isn't Uganda in Uganda. We don't have skateboarding. Why don't we start so skateboarding? Yeah. I thought that. I just think it's just that that that. It's almost like a light bulb moment. It's like a <laughs> catalyst. Uh, I, I can't really describe d- it, but it, it's magic. That's what it is. Yeah, it's it is magic. And it, I think that's why I'm so like drawn going, to those do articles. It. Let's absolutely do it. Yeah, I, yeah. I, because let's do this. Let's, let's fucking do it. <laughs> it's almost like it's it's the the true roots of what punk rock skating were all about. Is like metamorphosized into this uprising in a country that you'd never expect and that means so much more because of the hardships because because those things were always supposed to be for people that that struggled i think and that felt yeah. like outcasts yeah. Alterna- al- and yeah it's an alternative like skateboard has never been a mainstream spot and it's it, 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 exactly it's yeah dabbled, you know it, it's dabbed it's, it's toe in here and there and punk rock music and mainstream you know obviously you have the x games and you have green day but it, it comes of from course, an alternative place just finding those examples of of that sort of really true meaning of it still around and i think it means more because we've we've lived through bands like green day and, and bands like that and, and and i'm not dissing on any of those bands because i listened to them loads growing yeah, yeah. up and and they sort of molded me into who i am but we were lucky enough to have that literally on our doorstep i'd go to to the library and and rent cds and yeah. i'd have any punk cd i wanted but bands like people who are starting bands in Myanmar or people who are starting skating in Uganda, yeah. they don't have Sidewalk Magazine at their local shop, and yeah. they don't have Green Day in there. So it means so much more. Exactly. I couldn't agree more. Agree more. Um, so I also wanted to at least plug the spoken word night that you're doing. Oh, yeah. Which sounds absolutely incredible. It's Versus, Thanks, right? Yeah, Versus. Um, the first, we'll do it every two months it's in London. We just started it for National Poetry Day last year. Um, as a little experiment, I don't, I, I don't mind. I like writing poetry. But I don't mind performing it. It's okay. I enjoy it. But, but I like, I like playing music personally a bit more. But <laughs> we wanted to do it to, uh, we wanted to do it to offer a platform to those that might be interested in speaking poetry or anything they've yeah. written. And do you know what? It's actually worked out really well. Because although there are some fantastic poetry nights and spoken word nights all over London, as you can imagine. Um, we've tried to, I don't want to sound too bold and too pretentious, but we tried to reframe it and be like, you know what, this is for first timers and veterans. Yeah. You know, this is for yeah. if you just want to come check it out, if the poetry isn't your thing or if spoken word is something you've never really seen live, maybe come down and check it out. And so many people, we've had so many people so far, because it's an open mic as well, mainly. Go, so people, it's their first time doing it, and we we create a very safe and welcoming and encouraging atmosphere and, and culture there. And um, so a lot of people do it for the first time, and we've even had the bar staff at, at the venue come over, up from behind the bar, and go, "Fuck it, I wrote this poem years ago, but I'm going to perform it." And it's like, oh, that's oh, amazing! This is great. Yeah, so it, that's it, so it, cool. It's, it's really exciting, and it, it's just early. It's early days yet, but you know what? If, if we if we provide the space. Uh, and people feel comfortable enough to get up, our job's done. You know, I, I get my kicks. I would get my kicks playing music, and, and I've had plenty of opportunity to step out of my comfort zone. But for some people, their poetry or whatever they want to talk about just sits in their bedroom or sits on their computer, yeah. gathering digital dust. So I want. So we wanted yeah. to give people the opportunity to speak or to talk. And we've had people bring laptops and do like uh, a little presentation about like about social media, like all the, some people reading stories, short stories they've written, 
some people like freestyling, doing like free jazz poetry. It's really cool. It's Dude, that sounds amazing. I want to come down. Yeah, man, I want absolutely. to come down for sure. When I'm in London, uh, which will be end of next month, I will definitely from then try and uh, hit some up because it sounds yeah, wonderful. Man, versus poetry, versus poetry. It's not, it's not a vanity project. You know, it's not for me to showcase my words. It's for other people. And I genuinely mean that. Like, it's, it's, we didn't start it because I run it with my friend Nathan and my friend Nash. And they're also amazing, amazing poets and speakers. But Again, we're always like, we'll sit back and we'll, we'll, we'll let it unfold how it unfolds. That's beautiful. We only step in and do something as, as if uh, we haven't got as many open mic signups as we were yeah. before, so we need to fill a, fill a bit of time. So I'll get up there and waffle on about something for five minutes and then sit back down. But I think that uh, that encapsulates really the attitude that I think you, you have to a lot of the things you do, Jack. Uh, you are a very welcoming person who draws people in with with your attitude, and I think that uh, with with Waco, it's something that always has come across is that you're very approachable and uh, you don't try and take the limelight. I think that it's that you, that happens naturally because of your personality, if that makes any sense. Which is a very nice way to to go about things. Yeah, I can be quite a big character sometimes. Yeah. Uh, Ah, but that's that's a great thing. That's a great thing. I I know you want to try and cut short. But, um, I mean, I know you want to end it soon, but very quickly again, because this is something that's been on my mind a lot, and it's away from the band and it's away from poetry. But um, I'm on a bit of a spiritual journey, but I am also well into UFOs, right? So, uh, <laughs> so these two things they seem different, but they're not. They're I went not, to no. see a talk. I went to see a talk by a science fiction writer called Al Robinson. Is it? He's really cool. He he writes about like technology and spirituality and how they intertwine a little bit. And his books are, are all about that. But he wrote. He was talking about his, um, his beginnings of computing. How like some of the psychedelic thinkers from this year who were friends with the Grateful Dead and all that were actually some of the people inventing personal computing. And in that, it was really interesting. Ah, oh, that's but so cool. Touched, he also touched on the, the multiverse theory, where he thinks yeah. that. Um, Basically, he thinks that all these things have been... So take alien abduction, for example. These things have been... Dude, just two... Two two sex, sorry, dude. There's just someone at the door. I just need to let in, and I'll be right back with you. (laughs) Sorry. sorry. Okay, I'm back. So alien abductions and multiverses. So alien abductions. Take that, for example. He he would say alien abductions, as we know it, uh, they're not as we know it, the actual same thing has been happening throughout time. We just only rationalise it with whatever is the dish of the day or is is the thought process of the process of the day. So, for example, he took loads of Bible verses where I think St. Peter got, like, taken up into the clouds by angels and flown yeah. around and, you know, a bit of an out-of-the-body experience. And then he took other religious parts of religious scriptures to, to that seems a little bit like alien of alien abductions and he said now in the 20th century or from about 1940 onwards we now we now say that they're alien abductions we say we've been taken up and we've been flown around and shown ourselves and we can't explain it and there was people that and i thought this is quite interesting he said the constant our beliefs change and they always have changed you know through thousands of years but the same Kind of the same events are happening. We're just seeing it through of course. Lens yeah, yeah. whatever the day is. And so then I started reading. I was reading this book called Black Elk Speaks, which is a an interview with a Native American shaman uh, from the 1930s. He talks about his, his life. It's it's a fascinating book. But anyway, I was reading that but with all this rattling around in my brain, and then he, <laughs> and then Black Elk speaks about his vision, the great vision, and he gets abducted literally from his tent up into the sky and he gets thrown around but he's with horses he's with horses and they gallop <laughs> around and then he sees himself and he sees his family and he meets his elders but the elders don't look like elders they look kind of strange and um kind of spirited like spirits and yeah, i'm thinking yeah isn't that so interesting right is that so so interesting there, he's writing about it from the 1800s because that's his life and it was written in the 30s. And then 
obviously his point of reference is horses and elders and, and hunting and agriculture. So that's what he saw in his vision when he was up in the clouds. Whereas in the times of Christ, they saw it as an angel taking them up. And ever since the 20th century's yeah. dropped, sorry to repeat myself, but we've seen as alien abductions. And all, yeah, yeah, I, I'm so with Although you, yeah. they seem like individual, my friend Andy said, well, these are just individual experiences. We can't really prove it. But I, I thought, well, if so many people are having the same kind of experience, that's no longer an individual experience. That's a, I think that's a that's collective the thing, experience. Yeah. So, it's a, so all this, all this waffle I, I'm trying to get to is I also spoke, I also went to uh, Harry Krishna Temple recently, which George Harrison donated to the, George Harrison from the Beatles, he donated it to the Hare Krishna community. Um, and it's a fantastic place, just outside of London. And when I was there, a monk showed us around, and he lived as a monk in this, in this wonderful temple for 16 years. He was celibate, and he, he lived there, you know, living a godly life for 16 years. And anyway, he teased out a little bit of information, talking to us about the beliefs of the Hare, Hare Krishna community. And he, he started talking about these... Uh, how Krishna has these these different gods and dif- different versions of himself that live in bubbles and different entities and spirits that live in bubbles and they, they live on different planets but they visit our earth sometimes. And I was thinking, oh my God, this sounds like UFOs. And I said, mate, have you, is this how your your religious group would describe UFOs? And he said, he said, yeah, yeah, that's, he said, he said to me, the, the amount of information we have on UFOs within Hare Krishna religion would blow your mind. He said, it'd blow your mind. And I looked, I looked through his books and he had these books saying like UFOs and Hare Krishna. He had books that were called that. And I thought, fucking hell, man, there's something to it. Did you know, just to tie in with this, that um, there's been scientists that have been blacklisted from the scientists organization in the States um, because they believe in... Uh, in the fact that the the world was designed so that the creation came by design not by evolution although yeah. that's not they're not saying that evolution wasn't a part of that design they're just saying that that the big yeah. bang didn't happen and that the first organism wasn't didn't come about by accident but that something planted it and they were blacklisted but part part wow. of their description is that we think of these words through through the words that we're used to hearing the church say and through the propaganda that atheists also say who don't believe in religion we don't think of these words I- in a logical way so when someone says yeah. uh, creation by design we think of the bible and we think of god but we can quite yeah. easily have a conversation about the fact that there might be extraterrestrial life on another planet we don't ever think of of attaching those two together what if there's a race that is way more evolved than us and thousands of years came and actually sorted the planet out so that there could be life? For early human beings, those aliens would be a type of god and it's very easy that these things got sort of mixed up and, yeah. and are somehow related. Yeah, well, do, yeah, man, I'm with you the whole way. Like, Think about the, the term creationist. The creationist, that, 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 that's... Uh... That's the description of a certain type of Christian that believes that you know the world was created yeah, in yeah. seven days, and they they can be quite um, at loggerheads with with evolution. Um, but who's to say creationism has to be religious? Who like like it could exactly? Be, yeah. like, like you say, it could be it could be something else. If we believe in multiverses, which which loads of scientists, especially in the quantum physics the world of quantum physics, they will. It's almost fact that there's multiverses, there's different reality, there's different dimensions. So who's to say that we were created, but not in this, not in a dogmatic religious sense, but in a exactly, different sense. yeah, and, yeah. And I, I've had that thought before. With um, there's a museum in London called the Hunterian Museum, and it's uh, it's a bit like a mad scientist museum. It's, everything's like dead things in jars, so it's like. It's even, got like, <laughs> it's even got like dead humans in jars, like like unborn oh, wow. babies. It's got like camels' heads. It's got fish. It's got plants. It's got lungs, bones, everything in in jars, all all uh, preserved. And I remember walking around, and there's little <laughs> tiny descriptions of what each thing is. And I was looking, and, I, and one of the things was 
the inside of a lo- of some lungs, and I swear to God, like the veins in, 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 inside of human lungs, and I swear it looks like a tree. It looks exactly like a tree, like like yes. a tree. Yeah, with leaves. yeah. And I looked further. And I thought, you know, I'm not going to look at the at, at the captions. I'm just going to try and work out what it is. And it was so fascinating how much repetition <laughs> there is in nature. How much, how much like the inside of a cat's Absolutely. heart looks like a kind of bird's eye view of of a jungle or whatever it is so it was mind blowing so yeah i think i think that to be to be honest i think we're not the only people thinking this kind of thing that science and and uh spirituality or, or embracing the unknown i don't think they're they're butting heads as much as they're used to and i think the future will be some kind of combination of both of spirituality and and not being so dogmatic around science. The reasons people are so, like people like you were talking about, get blacklisted for suggesting there was a creator is because a lot of people, a lot of scientists' livelihood rely on the fact, on the of things course, being the way yeah, they are. Like, like you, you, you can't have some, some wild card coming out, uh, all like challenging scientific, the scientific fact because you'd be out of your job or you'd have to rewrite your thesis or you'd have to do all these kind of things. So I think... Which in itself is a ridiculous think, concept because surely the point of science is to to discover something new and disprove what was before. That's why that's why someone said the planet isn't flat, the <laughs> planets, and like everyone hated it. But if you don't, yeah. if you don't do that, then what are you, what are you doing as a scientist if you're not trying to disprove and prove something new? Yeah, n- exactly. Nothing is too big to be disproved. Like, yeah. like you just you, you got that. Like, people believed it was scientific fact that the world was was flat. Um, some people would argue that it, it that still is. is. Fact, yeah. <laughs> but uh, but the uh, so therefore nothing is too big. I don't think nothing is too nothing is beyond uh, scrutiny. Nothing yeah. nothing should be in the science world because that's how we progress. And then if you challenge it and challenge it and challenge it and it's and your theory of gravity or whatever is so robust that it can with, withstand all that scrutiny, then therefore that makes it stronger. But it shouldn't be yeah. like, yeah. it shouldn't just be fact, draw a line on it, move on. Um, what I was, think, go on, carry on. Yeah, I was just going to say that I think a big issue with the subject of spirituality, with a lot of the people that I talk to at least, is that they have preconceived ideas about religion, science, and all these things, but not through personal research of the subject themselves, but based on on things they've heard other people say. Um, so, for example, I've had a lot of people say to me, "Ah, oh, but the Bible's ridiculous. It says yeah. the world was created in seven days." I mean, technically, that's not true. That's creationists say the Bible said it was created in seven days. But the Bible says that every day in God's eyes is a thousand years in the eye of man. So you're actually talking about a, a, a lot of a bigger time frame uh, yeah, exactly. than what creationists talk about themselves. But people obviously hear things repeated and then base their opinions based on those things as opposed to going and, and researching it themselves so they can have, like, opinions. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's just it's, it's oversimplifying things. It, the, the truth is complex and complicated, and the truth isn't. It's not meant to be simple. Like, well, that's wrong. That's right. Exactly. The, the world's a bit more grey. Um, I want to ask in Jehovah's Witness in the Jehovah's Witness religion. Obviously, you're, you're my you're my only uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, of insight. Um, is you are you a aliens ever mentioned or or like because I I know some religious I, I know some guys in a religious organisation and they believe that UFOs are chariots the chariots from the Bible so when you see UFO it is literally a biblical chariot um is that, was it ever mentioned during your time with that no no that wasn't that wasn't mentioned uh I think Jehovah's Witnesses are very much of the idea that there is no extraterrestrial life. Um, my uh, not all Jehovah's Witnesses, but I think a lot of them live by the principle that if it's not mentioned in the Bible, it's not worth pondering over too much. If that makes okay. any sense, because it, it's, I think it's very easy when you're in a religion to become more used to the actual comfort of of the society you're in, 
than to the belief system you have, if that makes any sense. It's easier to, to like the community that's around you and to feel to feel very comfortable in that routine. And it's very difficult to ask questions that break that because those questions put your routine at risk, if that makes any sense. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's what, that's what people shy away from what I'll scoff at a lot of conspiracy theories uh, because it's like to to really commit or to really entertain the idea of some some of the conspiracy theories that are out there, that's like that's like declaring yourself a renegade, a rebel. You know, if 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 you say like I believe that hmm, maybe JFK wasn't killed by one person, perhaps there was more than one shooter. Just for example, and that's that's, that's <laughs> positioning yourself internally and externally yeah. as against the government. That's you, you have to admit. I think. The U.S. government lied to the world, or, or, or the CIA. So, so that is a really big thing to commit to. So I think, obviously, for some yeah. people, it's a little bit out of their out of their comfort zone. I totally understand that. It, it's, Especially because you make yourself a target as well. If you bring that up in a conversation at a pub, surrounded by your friends, the likelihood is that the majority of your friends are going to say you're an idiot. Yeah. Does that make it like? And that in itself is a huge barrier towards even considering considering believing that option because the first barrier is everyone's going to yeah, think exactly. I'm stupid well, yeah, I'm not even exactly. going to read into you're challenging this. it you're challenging the social norms or what's, what's socially accepted but I mean hey, that's not how you get to the truth by, by, by just going along with it it's not, it's not how you get you no know, life is that's the thing yeah and it's not interesting either right like that's boring as hell I'd rather yeah. hear far out ideas that there's no chance in hell I'm going to believe and I'd rather ask the questions and try and understand where they're coming from, then, then not have that conversation and chat to a load of people that are just going to repeat yeah, my yeah, beliefs yeah, back exactly. to me. I could not agree more. Um, just before we go, because I understand we've gone over an hour, um, can you... Uh, you've met Prince a few times as a Jehovah's Witness. No, right? I didn't meet Prince. Oh, really? No, I didn't meet Prince. I have been oh. at, the, at Twickenham... And walked past Prince Whoa! without saying hello to Woo! him. Well, <laughs> yeah, cha ching. And um, but I do know someone who has met Prince's mum. No, Prince's mum. Prince's uh, ex-wife. Um, oh no, that's a lie. That's a lie. I'm getting completely mixed up here. Um, so the thing is, you know, um, the guy from the Doors. His wife was also a Jehovah's oh, yeah. Witness. Yeah, Jim Morrison's wife is a Jehovah's Witness. So I know someone that's met and got a letter from Jim Morrison's wife, uh, basically being like, please don't listen to the doors anymore because he was, uh, I loved oh, him shit. to bits, but he wasn't a very did nice man. <laughs> yeah, um, did, did you, did, what did Prince do at the Twickenham? Did he ever perform? Did he no, no, they wouldn't, they wouldn't, uh, no, no, they like wouldn't have someone like Prince uh, up on stage at Twickenham or, and, they wouldn't draw that much attention to uh, wow. to the fact he was even there, to be honest, dude. Um, because that's not like they're very much about modesty, and they're very much about like like most Jehovah's Witnesses wouldn't even consider being in a band a possibility for a Jehovah's Witness, if that makes any sense. Um, it's just yeah, like but, but, all it, Jesus. Is that, why is that? Because music is it, or art is it a big deal in, in the Bible? Sure, I it think. Is. No, it is, absolutely. And in fact, there's a lot of musicians who are Jehovah's the Witnesses. Oh, no, like, the killers uh, Sorry, man, I think. No, yeah, not Jehovah's Witnesses. But one of the people from The Shadows was Hank Marvin, was a Jehovah's Witness. He was actually an elder as well. But obviously, that's the most inoffensive music you yeah, could yeah. ever be making, The Shadows. You're like, do you know what I mean? They yeah, wore right. suits, and I think he got away with that. <laughs> the Trying to start a band that sounds like Blink-182 yeah. when you're supposed to be like, like giving talks, yeah, <laughs> it's a bit different. Um, we obviously need to plug the band as well. Is there any new music coming out? Is there anything you want to to say about it? Any gigs that you want yes. to point out? Yes. Yeah, so, um, the tragedy. Um, uh, we feel very disorientated and very um, just. Very sad because we, our ba our bassist died recently. Our, our, our long time bassist, and we've always had the same lineup. So our, our friend Chris, uh, he passed away in December, and it, it's just been so difficult. 
But we decided to carry, uh, continue after much deliberation. Believe me, we've been talking about it in morning and discussing it and speaking to his family. But, but we, we decided to keep the band going because we've got a full of album, course. our debut album, Human Magic, which that's our name for it. Um, the that he plays on that, our Chris plays on it. We've got music videos with him in it. So it's like, this is his swan song, man. This is what he's left behind for the world to enjoy. I really wish he was still here. Um, but uh, of course, we just want to do him proud. So we have, we're going to release the album this year. We've got our latest singles out, The Jersey Devil. And it's it's just, uh, you know, we're going, to, we're going to do it, man. We're going to do it for him. We're going to fucking smash it. And so we've got a gig coming up in London, The Dome. I love the dome, man. What a good venue. Yeah, it's saw, such a cool venue, right? I saw some great bands in there. I saw Radio Birdman and I saw Cadaver. But they um so we're playing there on the thirteenth of April, and that's gonna be our first gig with our bassist uh James, who was Chris's friend and our friend, and he'd stepped up and he offered, yeah. he offered to take the reins. So it's um it's really it's been really uh, what's the word? It's just been fucking mad. It's been bananas, but the uh but you know what? We're going to do it. Continuing. Waco. Viva Waco. But yeah, you can find us wacoband.co.uk. Of course, dude. I'll find us on Spotify and that. W-A-C-O. I will be linking to everything yeah, so everyone can yeah. listen to it. And obviously it's... And it's... Human, human magic is out this year. It's, 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 it's a blinder. The first time I've ever made an album and I'm, I'm psyched. I can't wait to hear it, dude. I'm so excited. <laughs> like, everything, everything that you guys have released is... Uh, is an instant favourite for me. I think that uh, you put so much energy and positive <laughs> vibes out into uh, a punk scene that definitely needs the example of a band like you. Like, absolutely. Oh, thanks, man. That is so absolutely. kind. Dude, I've I've enjoyed chatting to you so much. Um, <laughs> really and I'm it. sure it won't be won't be the last time we have a no, conversation man. like this. I'm sure there will be uh, there will be more to come. And hopefully I can see you in uh, in London real soon. Yeah, man, I'm looking forward to our friendship deepening because this is a great chat and I, and I loved I loved it, man. Um, Absolutely. Mate, you're, you're in, I love the podcast. I listen to your other episodes and you're a natural host and I, I cannot send enough positive vibes your way, man. You deserve it and you're going to do... You're going to do really well. Oh, dude. This. Thank you so much. That means, that means the world coming from you, dude. Seriously. <laughs> Bless. Right. Um, I will uh, chat to you soon then, Jack. Thanks so much, yeah? yeah? So I really hope you enjoyed that episode. I enjoyed chatting to Jack so much and I'm looking forward to having him on the show again in the future, hopefully face to face. I'm going to start trying to implement the video aspect of things so if you're watching on YouTube you have something to look at, not just uh, the image that is the cover photo for the episode, but you can actually see me talking or ideally sometimes have face-to-face -face conversations with my guests so that we're both in the same room, which will hopefully also encourage the conversation to, to flow. I think they're flowing quite smoothly anyway, but, but they have a different vibe when you're chatting to someone face-to-face -face and can react quicker to what they're saying. But yeah, I'm going to test how doing video as an intro and outro goes for now to see if it actually affects any of the ratings. Um, but if you did enjoy the episode, please, please hit the subscribe button, which is somewhere around. Um, please leave us a review because that really helps and share it with anyone that you think would enjoy listening to it. I will catch you soon. Thanks for listening.